Hello lovelies, in this video we are going to be looking at the light independent reaction in photosynthesis for your A level biology. Now this links to the previous video on the light dependent reaction and there are lots of things that you will see that are the same and lots of things that we see are the different. However, it is very very important that you know the difference between the light dependent and the light independent stages in photosynthesis. So get ready to make notes and enjoy the video. So we're going to start looking now at the light independent reaction. Let's have a quick recap first of what we've already talked about. So the light dependent reactions happen in the lamellae, the thylakoid, the granule, folded membranes. That's where the light dependent reactions happen because that's where light's being absorbed, remember, by the photosynthetic pigments. And so let's remind ourselves what we produced from those light dependent reactions. So we made some oxygen and that, remember, diffuses out of the leaf diffuses out of the chloroplast and then potentially diffuses out of the leaf. We also made some ATP and some reduced NADP. Or remember, we can have NADPH plus H plus. These two are we are need, going to need. They moved into the stroma, and the stroma is where we're going to be doing our light independent reactions. That's where they take place. Now they're called the light independent reactions because no light is needed for them to take place. So they can obviously happen at night. When we talk about photosynthesis and plants only happening in the daylight or not happening at night time, it's not completely correct. What we're actually saying is the light independent reactions can only happen in the daytime. The light independent reactions can happen at night, but they do need the products of the light dependent reactions. So they can only function up until the point when those um, that ACP and that reduced NADP that we make in the light dependent reaction runs out. So let's have a think about our equation. We've got our first synthesis equation. I'm just using the symbol equation here for shortness. So we've got carbon dioxide and water, and then we're gonna be producing oxygen and glucose as we have learned the equation so far. So let's think about what we've already used so far in this equation, what we've already produced to figure out what the light deep independent reactions are going to give us. We've used the water, one of our reactants, we used it in photolysis. And in photolysis, if you remember, we then used that water to split it and we made some oxygen from that. And that was our waste product. So that was also produced in photolysis. So that means we don't, that's how our light dependent reactions are involved in this equation. So what we've got left is we've got carbon dioxide as a reactant and sugar glucose as a product. So the light independent reaction is all about taking that carbon dioxide, which is going to diffuse in to the chloroplast, it's going to diffuse into the leaf, remember through the stomata, and then into the cytoplasm of cells, palisade cells, for example, and then diffusing into the chloroplast, and we're going to be using that carbon dioxide to make glucose. And then the plant can take that glucose and use it to make all of the products or all of the molecules, organic molecules that the plant needs to survive. So we're talking amino acids, lipids, nucleic acids, as well as sugars, and then making that glucose and turning it into things like starch, cellulose, etc. So that's what the light independent reactions are all about. So let's have a look at how we do that. So the light independent reactions is actually known as the Calvin cycle. That encompasses all of the reactions we're gonna talk about. It happens in a cycle named after the man who discovered it, who we'll talk about later. So first step then, we've got carbon dioxide entering the leaf through the stomata and then it diffuses into the stroma of the chloroplast, diffuses through the membrane into the stroma of the chloroplast because that's where this Calvin cycle is taking place. Next, we have that carbon dioxide being combined with a five carbon compound called RUBP. Its long name is ribulose bisphosphate, but you can shorten it to RUBP, just try and remember to make the U a lowercase u. So we're combining carbon dioxide with RUBP. So this is a chemical reaction, and as always, chemical reactions need to be catalyzed by enzymes. 
and the enzyme that catalyzes this combining of carbon dioxide with our EBP is called Rubisco. So it catalyzes the reaction. That carbon dioxide is now said to have been fixed. It's been pulled out of the atmosphere and fixed into a molecule. And in the same way, the RUBP has been carboxylated. A carbon dioxide molecule has been added to it. So this gives this stage its two names. We can either call it the carbon fixation stage or we can call it carboxylation. Because we've combined a five carbon molecule and a single carbon molecule in carbon dioxide, we make, in theory, a six carbon compound. But this is so unstable, this six carbon compound, that it basically breaks up immediately and it forms two three carbon molecules called GP or glycerate three phosphate. But again, you can just shorten it to GP or even G3P if you'd like to. So before we move on to the next bit, this is the part that can have the limiting effect. It can be the rate limiting step of the light independent reactions. Obviously, the light dependent reactions are reliant on light. And if light was limiting, they would be limited. Here, we don't have that. But what we can do to limit these reactions is if we don't have enough CO2, for whatever reason, or the action of Rubisco, which is an enzyme. So if the enzyme isn't there, or the enzyme is working slowly, or the enzyme is denatured, then that becomes the rate limiting step in photosynthesis. So if there is enough light, the light dependent reactions take place, but the, the Rubisco and carbon dioxide reaction here is what can slow down the rate of photosynthesis at this stage. We'll come back and look and talk about that when we look at factors that affect respiration in the next video. We've now, we've got our carbon dioxide, we've combined it with our RUBP, catalyzed by Rubisco. That's broken down into two molecules of GP, and now we have to take or use some of the products from our light dependent reactions. So in this case, we're using some of the ATP and the H plus from the reduced NADP are going to be used to reduce my GP. And now that's why this stage is called reduction, because all we're doing is reducing GP. And remember, we talked before about oil rig. So oxidation is loss of electrons or hydrogen and reduction is gain of electrons or hydrogen. So that's why my GP is being reduced because it's going to be gaining H plus uh, and some electrons from Na, uh, from reduced NADP. So step six then, what do we make from reducing GP? It forms two, still two, still three carbon molecules, but now we've reduced the GP into triose phosphate, TP, but we can't shorten this one, so we have to write out triose phosphate. It's also known as GALP, G-A-L-P, which you can use a shorter version, or glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which is its long name. So TP uh, tri stands for triose phosphate, so we are making triose phosphate or GALP, and these are sugars, okay? So this is where we've got sugar first appearing in our cycle. The ATP has obviously been used, which means it's been hydrolyzed to form ADP and inorganic phosphate. And as we've said, we've taken the hydrogens and electrons away from the reduced NADP, and it's just gone back to being an ADP. So those two, the ADP, the inorganic phosphate, and the NADP, return back to the thionicoid membrane to be reused in the light dependent reaction. So they get recycled back and then they get reused. The ADP and the phosphate get recombined to make ATP in the electron transport chain. And then the NADP will be there to be the final electron acceptor and, redu and get reduced again. And so then they come back here and they just go round and round doing that in a cycle. Step eight then, what we actually use the majority of the gout uh, slash triose phosphate is for, is for regenerating RUBP. So most of it, five out of six of the molecules 
are used to regenerate our UVP so it can go back and start the cycle again and be combined with carbon dioxide. Some of it is used to make organic molecules. We'll talk about that in a second. Final stage then. So in order to do that, in order to regenerate our UVP using GALF or triphosphate, is we need to use the rest of the ATP that was produced in the light-dependent reactions. So we need that energy from hydrolyzing that ATP. We, it's left over. We didn't use it all up in the first um, stage, in the reduction stage. We need to use it in order to regenerate the RUVP. It goes through a series of reactions. We don't need to know the detail. We just need to know it gets regenerated and that in order to regenerate it, we need to use five out of the six of our GALP molecules and also uh, some ATP from the light-dependent reactions. And then because we've regenerated the RUVP, it goes back to the start of the cycle and hence why this is a cycle, because we start with a molecule and we finish with that same molecule and it goes round and round and round. So I mentioned before that we use it to make, uh, we use the GALP and slash TP to make biological molecules. We do. So some of it is used to produce glucose or convert it to glucose in a process we call gluconeogenesis. You'll recognise that from the same process that happens in the liver. We've done the home when we do the homeostasis topic. It can then, some of it, once it's made into glucose, can be converted into sucrose for transport, starch for storage, cellulose for cell walls, whatever we need. But not all of that gout is converted into glucose. Some of it's used to make things like lipids, amino acids, nucleic acids, combining it with some nitrogen, combining it, it's an organic molecule and we need it to make more organic molecules, all of the organic molecules that the plant needs for life. So while yes, the synthesis does make glucose, it also makes or the products, the gout, is, the TP is used to make all the molecules that the plant needs. So last thing then just to think about, only one gout slash triosphosphate molecule is made per turn of this you'll notice that actually all the way round, there's been more than more molecules than I've labeled. So there's actually, we start with three carbon dioxide molecules. That gives us three RUBPs, which ultimately makes six GPs, because if you think about it, they're splitting into two each. So we get six GPs, and then they get converted into six GALPs, and five out of six of those GALPs go back to regenerate RUBP and one is then used in order to go on and make organic molecules. So you actually need this cycle to turn three times to get just one GALP slash triosphosphate molecule. And if you think about it, GALP slash triosphosphate is only a three carbon molecule. If we wanted to make a hexo sugar like glucose, we'd actually need it to turn six times to produce two GALPs in order to be able to put them together to get a glucose molecule. So it's not as simple as one turn, one glucose, it's three turn gets you one sugar molecule, one GALP, one triosphosphate, which you could use to combine with others to make glucose. If you needed two to make glucose, it would be six turns because the majority is used every single time to regenerate our UBP. Okay, so let's have a look at the summary of our product. So what are we making? from the light independent reactions and where are they going? So our NADP, our ADP and our inorganic phosphate are all passing back into the thylakoid for the light dependent reactions and they get used again. Our GALP or triosphosphate, depending on which way you've been taught and which exam board you do, some is used to regenerate RUVP or most is used to regenerate RUVP and some is used to make amino acids, lipids, nucleic acid, glucose, all the essential molecules that plants need. But yes, most is used to regenerate our UVP, so it just stays in the stroma and goes back. And then some is used to make organic molecules, including glucose. And then obviously we technically make our UVP at the end of our um, cycle. So once it's regenerated, it stays in the stroma and then it re-enters the Calvin cycle again at the start, just like we did at the start of the cycle with uh, combining with carbon dioxide. So photosynthesis itself is obviously a self-sustaining in terms of being able to send back and reuse um, products from the light independent as 
part of the light dependent reactions but obviously we need those inputs still so we need water we need to make sure we've got enough carbon dioxide in order for that cycle to keep flowing okay so let's think about how we know this is what happens how do we know that this is what the calvin cycle is how did we get there well we said that we tell you about the man who invented it and that is obviously dr calvin it's named after him and he called it or it has been coined his lollipop experiment because he's using this lollipop shaped glass flat flask on a stick like setup and hence the term lollipop. So inside his glass, kind of flat lollipop glass disc, he had green algae. The species was known as chlorella. So they remember they're photosynthetic plants that live in water, that's what algae are. And they are sitting in this glass um, jar in water, happily photosynthesizing, because there's a light source on them that is constantly there, or it was controlled in terms of when it was on and when it was off, but they had light to photosynthesize. They also had air ventilation, so oxygen could leave and come in as well for respiration, and we had that kind of uh, flow in and out. And then there was a source of carbon-14, radioactive carbon. And the reason for this is, rather than using regular carbon dioxide, he wanted them to have a source of radioactive carbon that would be taken in for photosynthesis in order to be able to trace where that carbon then goes through the cells of the algae and through the chloroplasts. And then underneath the lollipop, we have like a little tap and that fed into some hot alcohol. So like I said, this was um, set up by Dr. Melvin Calvin, who eventually won the Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1961 for discovering this method of how plants use photosynthesis to make sugars and so it was obviously named after him as the Calvin cycle. So as I said the source of carbon-14 is there so the plants will take it in, absorb it like um, carbon dioxide, use it to do the Calvin cycle in, and so the carbon dioxide would be carbon-14 as a source and then any products made from that will contain the carbon-14, and that is radioactive. So it's able to be traced using autoradiography, similar to how we talk about the plant transport experiments and observing how the sugars move through the phloem. It's a very similar method. So how did he get samples to test? So the tap at the bottom enabled him to dispense out a small amount of algae at five second intervals. So they'd be exposed to light for five seconds, he'd take a sample. 10 seconds, take a sample. 15 seconds, take a sample. And each time he takes a sample, each time he turns the tap, the algae would fall, fall down into this hot alcohol. And because they'd fall down into hot alcohol, it's hot and it's alcohol, so it will do two things. It will immediately kill the algae because of the toxicity of the alcohol, and it denatures any enzymes immediately because of the temperature, so it basically kills them instantly, and there is no more photosynthesis or respiration or any reactions being carried out, so they're kind of frozen in time as they fell out at each time interval that he opens the tap. And so he would do a five-second run, that um, algae would be killed in the hot alcohol, he'd remove that and that would be his five second time storage, uh, five second time sample. He'd then leave it running for another five seconds, they get 10 seconds, drop it out, remove, drop it out, remove and keep going until he had samples of dead algae from all the different time intervals. So then what would he do? He'd take the samples from each time point and he'd analyse it using two-way chromatography, which is where you run the samples up woods up a solvent front and then you turn the paper 90 degrees and rerun them so for every dot you get in the first set of chromatography you then redo those dots and get split those samples into more samples to get smaller and smaller fractions of the molecules that are making up those first few dots that you get so we've separated out all the carbon compounds and then because they can, some of them contained radioactive carbon, he laid them on uh, X-ray film. And so that would cause the radiation to be able to identify them as uh, splodges or splots. And then he compared the films from the different time lengths. So the five seconds, the 15 seconds, the 30 seconds. Because he saw that more and more products were being made and he could tell over time that he'd get more and more different carbon compounds. 
And then he was able to identify what those carbon compounds were eventually. And that showed you the order that they were being made in. So we start with IUBP, then we get GP, and then we get GAU or TP. And so because of that, he could tell the order that these compounds were being made in, and he could tell that there was a cycle. And so he used this to determine the order that these compounds were being made in the end. Now, this goes into a lot of detail that you might not necessarily need to know, but it's nice to explain how we discovered these scientific phenomena and, and how it worked out. And you can kind of use your knowledge of chromatography to kind of figure out how he discovered this. So let's do a final summary of all of the kind of what's happening as a way of writing it out quite nice and succinctly in a way you could use for a long answer question, for example. So first, carbon dioxide combines with RUBP, catalyzed by Rubisco. This produces two molecules. This part's really important. So you get two molecules of GP. GP is then reduced to GALP or triose phosphate. Remember, we can't shorten triose phosphate to TP. We have to say it in full. It's reduced using energy. This is important. Don't just say using ATP. Using energy from ATP and using H plus ions and electrons or just H plus ions from reduced NADP or NADPH plus H plus if you're writing it that way. GALP or triose phosphate, um, yeah, not TP, GALP or triose phosphate is then used, most of it is used to regenerate RUBP, and some is used to go on and make organic molecules, including glucose, but also amino acids, lipids, whatever you choose to mention. And there we have it. That is a simple summary of the light independent reactions written out as I would write it for an extended response answer. Hopefully that was pretty simple and found that fairly easy to follow. So we're going to look at now factors, putting all this together, factors that affect photosynthesis in the next video. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.